Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is still strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott, and usually Cam the Provocateur would jump in here, and usually we would be talking about the knock list, but this is a declassified episode, and uh, the film we're talking about this week is not available in North America, so Cam just has to sit there and edit this, and uh, has not seen the film, unfortunately. But I am fortunate enough to be joined by two very special agents. Firstly, we have Mr. John Byrne at Not Perfected Yet. How are you doing, sir? I'm very well, thank you. And we have also joining us Miss Alice Dryden at Husketeer on Twitter. Hello, how are you? Hi, well, I am still recuperating from this movie, which was a serious danger money mission for us. And it was weeks ago you and I saw it in the theatres as well. It's very fresh in my memory. Yeah, it's like an open wound. <laughs> um, Well, the movie, if we can call it such a thing, I think before we do introduce the movie, uh, uh, those those clicking on the actual podcast will know what the film is, but... Let's just do a little word association real quick. If I say Michael Flatley, what do you immediately think of? Dance. Lord. Yep, that sounds about right. Well, guess what, folks? He made a spy film, and it's called Blackbird, and it's out now in some theatres in the UK. It's not really getting a release elsewhere. Apparently there's some streaming in Ireland, although I've not seen any proof of this. But yeah, Michael Flatley. Blackbird. I mean, it's a bit of a strange film, and we'll get into that, but for those who have never heard of Michael Flatley first, I mean, I've admitted this, I'm not much of a Flatley fan, I don't know much about him, I'm not a flat hard. Um, (laughs) I'll throw it out to you both. Could could anyone give me sort of a quick, who is Michael Flatley? Well, I always remember him from being... Uh, obviously the Lord of the Dance with Riverdance back in the early 90s. I'm pretty certain it was a British bylaw that everyone had to either have a VHS copy of Riverdance or Police Stop in their house at any time in 1993 because that was just it. Everyone owned it. It was a pop culture thing. Whether you watched it or not, you knew. Riverdance and Lord of the Dance is the same thing, so I've never been quite clear on this. I think it's two different shows, actually, because it started with Riverdance. I'm no expert on Michael Flatley as well, but definitely no. Riverdance was what brought him to fame. So, yeah, I, I, go, go on, Alice. Oh, I can tell you one fun fact about Riverdance. Go ahead. Which is that there is an animated version of Riverdance in which Pierce Brosnan voices a giant elk. Well, I'm sold. Well, they, that's it, yeah. that's a That sounds like a special episode for Spy Hearts. Uh, I, I, I'd watch that just for Pierce Brosnan, to be fair. Is Michael Flatley in that too? I don't think so. Hmm. Well, for those who don't know, for North Americans listening, for people all around the world who may not know who Michael Flatley is, he's a very famous Irish dancer. Sort of the Irish jig uh, is basically kind of the, the dance. I'm I'm very much like minimising his contribution to dance, and I'm sorry Michael Flatley fans out there. Um, but that's what he's known for. He's known for being a professional dancer. He he made a, a worldwide sensation with the, you know, the Lord of the Dance, the River Dance. That I, I remember like, Friends, the TV show talking about river dance, so it must have gone across the sea. Oh yeah, yeah, he's actually so important. I read that uh, he had his legs insured for forty million dollars. Lethal weapons, one might say. <laughs> well, I guess that's Michael Flatley's credentials. So why has he done a spy film? That is the question that we have to try and answer today. Because basically, what from what I can tell from my research is this is a self-funded film. He had an idea for a script or someone gave him a script, but though apparently it's written by him, remains to be seen. Uh, He wanted to make it so badly that he didn't want to wait for any funding, so he funded it himself. This is, uh, I I believe John quoted this to me the other day, but Mark Commode said, it's not a vanity project, it's an insanity project, Uh, which is a great line, Mark Commode. Um, Yeah, so this is a, a vanity project by someone who has never acted, but really just wants to do a spy film. Uh, and so that sets it up. Here's your letterbox.com synopsis, and then we're going to talk about Blackbird. Blackbird. Some things are still worth dying for. 
troubled secret agent Blackbird abruptly retires from the service and opens a luxurious nightclub in the Caribbean to escape the dark shadows of his past. An old flame arrives and reignites love in his life, but she brings danger with her. Dum, dum, dum. That sounds like your average James Bond film, I have to say. It does, yeah. It's a little thin for a film which has such a thin plot to begin with. You don't really get much of the idea of the story from that. No. I mean, we'll question if there is a story, but let, let, let's just discuss it. So, I mean, this film is being shown in a few cinemas in the UK. I have a feeling it will end up on streaming at some point. I, I have to think. Like, it will oh, be on Amazon Prime. Well, it's won a streaming award at the Monaco uh, Streaming Film Festival of 2021. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but... Yeah, w- walk us through that, John. I wasn't going to bring it up, but... Oh, I think you must bring it up. Is, is it for being a stream of piss? Well, I, I mean, this is an award-winning spy film, which is uh, more than I can say for some of the other films we tackled on this podcast before. But yeah, I, I, I'm going to try and find the award. Uh, good, good luck. But it, uh, apparently, yeah, apparently it's very hard to track down. But it's something to do with, like best. Was it best actor? It was best actor for Michael Flatley. Believe it or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, that remains to be seen. But, you know, we've all seen this at the Prince Charles Cinema in, in London. Uh, Alice and I went together a few weeks ago. John, you literally watched it yesterday, so you are still reeling in that flatly love. Oh, it is freshly burned into my retinas, yes. You're doing a jig as you record this. Oh, my feet are tapping away under this table. <laughs> I can see the smoke rising. Yeah. Was it a full house for you, John? It, uh, it was pretty full. There, we there was a few seats left over because um, I went to the very last showing, which they added kind of last minute. Because when we went, it was an absolute full house. Yeah, absolutely. It was. Uh, yeah, I mean, we were about 10 seats short, I think. Maybe, maybe a little less than that. I think we went a couple of days yeah. after the uh, Mark Kimode review came out. Mm-hmm. And so everyone was so pumped. And I did wonder, you know, talking about why he might have made this, whether it was a producer's style tax write-off scam and the idea was it would fail terribly and he would somehow get a load of money. But if that was the idea, then the Prince Charles has foiled him with its sellout. And and they're not the only place to run it as well. There's several theatres in London that have run it and some in just around England and loads in Ireland have played it. Uh, I don't know how long for, but it has actually made some money. It's quite hard to track any sort of box office on it, but it has made more money than some things that have been released theatrically. So it it's not a complete flop in that sense. But yeah, it was a packed house at the Prince Charles for Alice and I. I mean, people were hooping and hollering before the film started. It was like clapping as the credits started rolling. It was insane. Oh, they cheered everything. It was wonderful. Um, the fact that it was made by Dance Lord Productions, yeah! Um, Michael Flatley's name, yeah! Rolling shot of Ireland and a big house, yeah! Drone shots, yeah! Lots of drone shots. But was that the same experience for you yesterday, John? It was literally insanity for an hour and a half. It was, but in a slightly different way. We weren't so much getting clapping. It started off with giggling, and then it became guffawing, and then it just became outright banterous laughter i i see i felt like our crowd alice and i's crowd was uh very much uh, full of libations beforehand there was a definite rowdiness it was 9 p.m wasn't it so there was plenty mm. of chance earlier in the evening you got a solid three hours after work uh, we were nerds and spent the hour before in a lego store but everyone <laughs> else was uh everyone else was probably <laughs> having a merry time down the pub but um let, let's get down to business let's talk about this Bizarre, obscure film. I'm going to throw it to Alice first. What are your sort of top line thoughts on Blackbird? Well, um, this is actually an example of my favourite genre of film, which is um, films ripping off James Bond. And there are a lot of films in the 60s that you know, tried to jump on the Bond bandwagon. And I love all that stuff. And this is that updated for the Daniel Craig era. It was quite a beautiful thing in that respect. So would you say that uh, you enjoyed the film? I did, but uh, I think the circumstances helped a lot. I think if you have a lot of other people who are also really digging how terrible it is, if I'd, I think some people were reporting going to their local Odeon and 
there being maybe two other people in the audience, I don't think I'd have enjoyed just cackling all by myself like a madman. No, I I definitely dig that. I spoke to a couple of people online that said, yeah, I just saw it at a cinema world with one person in the theater with me. And I remember like going to a screening of Ghost in the Shell years ago by myself and then having the usher walk in during a scene where the animated character is topless. And it's just me sitting in the crowd. And I thought, wow, this is not my proudest moment, everyone. Hey, 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 buddy. How you doing? <laughs> um so yeah, I'm glad we had that experience. But um, it sounds like it sounds like you were kind of on board with it in its own sort of weird magic. Yeah, it was utterly mindless entertainment. I I didn't actually care that it made no sense and all the stuff about the disc or the virus or whatever it was was total nonsense because, frankly, I have trouble following the plots of Bond films. And if you ask me why in a Bond film I've seen twenty times, Bond does this or goes here, I go I, I don't know plot. Yep, something has to happen for 90 minutes. Yep. Yeah. Or okay. two and a half hours, as it seems to be these days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you could tell me the, the plot of Octopussy, I think anyone gets an award for doing that one. It's, <laughs> uh, it still baffles me to this day. But, um, John, what about you? Your your thoughts on Blackbird? I thought it was an utterly fascinating piece of filmmaking. L- literally, it was... Th- this film, ultimately without shying away from it, is Michael Flatley wanted to be a spy. He wanted to be like James Bond. He made himself a film. He wrote himself a character. It's the sort of thing you, if you had the money, you'd make it, and then on a Friday night you'd invite your friends around your house to watch it and then just have some drinks with them. Not release it theatrically and expect it to to make money. But um, yeah, the audacity he had to write and direct it. I'm just watching the film, and I'm thinking, he's watched a lot of films, and he's seen a lot of good directors, like people like Scorsese or Nolan, and he's tried to replicate as many directorial techniques, but he has no idea how to use them in any way, shape, or form. Um, oh, the, like a, a cargo cult. <laughs> hey, I'll put this thing there, and then a film will happen. It's um, there's, there's this sequence which I was watching it, and I it instantly reminded me of um, the scene in Goodfellas where Ray Liotta goes into the Copacabana and the camera follows him through the kitchen and they bring out the night into the nightclub and they put the table down for him. And what you have here is it's similar to that, as you have um, Eric Roberts and the, and the love interest Vivian entering into um, into Flatley's uh, like you know, nightclub at his beach hotel and the camera follows all the characters round and moving around them, but everyone is out of sync with each other and people are moving at very slow paces some people are jumping locations around and it just looks very odd and weird but he wanted to do that shot it seemed and he just didn't know how to or at least a to- tried to do it i mean you've got to give the guy credit in 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 like a sheer hubris of like hey i'm gonna make my own film sodge a lot of you I want to be a spy. I want to be James Bond. And I have the money to make it look okay. Like, it looks okay. They're, they've, they're using... It's in, it looks good. Like, it's been shot on nice cameras. There's drone shots. Like, it... I mean, the, the, you know, the action sequences aren't that great. And there's a moment where Michael Flatley takes down a man that's twice his size in a very awkward fashion that I think I'm still recovering from uh, just seeing that moment. But I agree with both of you. There's something kind of nice about it. He's clearly trying to riff off of things he loves. And I think we could all share with him a love of cinema. I think I could, we could all tip our hats to him in that sense. Fair play to him. But man, is this a tough watch in ways. I mean, if if there was no magic in the cinema that we were all experiencing, I, I, I could only imagine pulling what's left of my hair out, uh, trying to watch this man act. He's got other actors around him. Eric Roberts is like the B-movie superhero nowadays. You know, I saw him back in the Doctor Who TV movie back in the 90s and thought this guy was a bit, hmm. He's still not oh, great, yes. but like he's like kind of like, like, he's like a panto villain almost. He was having a lot of fun. Was I the only one that noticed about halfway through the film, there's a scene where Eric Roberts appears to be drunk and he just never recovers from that and he just seems utterly sozzled for the rest of the film. <laughs> I mean, you would be. You would be. Yeah, I don't think he was acting, though. That's the point. <laughs> he's seen the script. He's like, well, uh, who cares? Let's get it down me. But, like, he's got other... Like, uh, Ian Beatty, he's been in stuff. Like, he plays the uh, Michael Flatley. We should introduce him. Michael Flatley plays uh, Victor Blakely. 
aka the Blackbird. Uh, but he has his best friend Ian Beatty that was part of this team of spies, top secret agents, I guess, um, who were both retired to work in this casino resort in the Caribbean. It's a nice so that, that's Nick, right? Yeah, the that's best Nick. Friend, the uh, washed up alcoholic. He was a surprise hit. I mean, completely won over the hearts and minds in our audience with his uh, humorous drunk, washed up ways, and uh, by the time we were halfway through, every time he appeared, people would go, Nick! And, I mean, it goes back to, to John's point, I think quite well put, is, is everyone's in a different film, almost, you know? Michael Flatley is in some galaxy, probably Andromeda, I don't know. Eric Roberts is a pantomime villain to me. Nick, by Ian Beatty's Nick is like screaming his way through the film like it's a horror film or something. He's just shouting all the time. Um, and then also you've got Michael Flatley copping off with a bunch of like 23-year-old women and this guy's in his 60s. I was going to mention all the women and uh, the fatal attraction of uh, Mr. Blackbird and poss- possibly his casino running riches. Um, it- it's one explanation. Yeah, I think it's his hat game. <gasps> Strong hat game. I was going to get to the hat. The hat, it's... I mean, there's probably going to be a drinking game made when this is released on streaming of, like, how many times does he swap clothes or swap hats? And you have to take a shot every time. Because I think Alice and I were cheering every single time there was a costume or hat change. I think Mark Kermode mentioned the hat, so there was a lot of interest in the hats. Ah. There, there was one point where he is handed a hat but doesn't put it on yet. It's possibly the biggest moment of suspense in the film and people in the audience are going, put the hat on! <laughs> oh, for me, in my screening, the cinema actually erupted at one point when he's storming out of the hotel and he's arguing with Nick and some employee walks past him, hands him a replacement hat, which he switches over and just puts on and walks away without acknowledging at all. And yeah, that was something else to behold. I... It's hard to kind of classify this film in a way because I, I know Mark Camo was talking about like uh, Tommy Wiseau's The Room. Like, that's a pretty bad film. It's achieved status in the sense of like one of the worst films of all time. Trolls 2 is up there too with some of the worst films. I'm not sure I would put this on par with The Room. I know Mark Camo didn't in a sense, but like I, I don't know if this is as bad. I wouldn't think it was as bad. I, mean, I have no interest in seeing The Room. Because why would I go and see a bad movie? But tell me it's a bad spy movie, and I- I'm straight there. I, I I'd always recommend going and see the room in, in a group setting, much like we saw uh, Blackbird. It, it's it's like a car crash, and that's the that's the fun. But okay, well let's talk about <clears throat> Michael Flatley himself, our Blackbird. I mean, I got it. As I said, I tip my hat to the guy. My hat, haha. <laughs> um, for having the having the powers to do so and making his dream come true, he's not a good actor. Can we are we all agreed on that, or, or is anyone going to defend uh, Al Flatley? Uh, yeah, no. Though I will say that he has proof that literally anyone looks good in black tie. He does look very good in his tie. And fair play to the guy. He also looked pretty good with his top off. I it's the one good thing missing from that film was a scene where Michael Flatley walks out of the sea in his trunks. I'm surprised that's not an element. It felt like it was building to it, didn't it? It felt like it was. Like he was going to give himself the Daniel Craig from Casino Royale. Hey, if you've got the body for it, be proud. I'm all for it. I think that that moment you got there was the the scene where he's topless and he's shaving and just staring at himself in the mirror in the most bizarrely lovingly way. (laughs) As one would. Um... Well, that's... As one should, it's very healthy. We should all be more positive about our own bodies. I, I often look at myself in the mirror. Maybe, maybe not on film, though. No, I, I tend to weep when I look in the mirror, but that's a different story. Um, well, look, the plot for those who... The problem is because this is a very hard film to find for people. So I guess we should kind of go through the plot a little bit just and just sort of spell it out. As we mentioned, Michael Flatley's Victor Blakely is a retired James Bond esque spy um retires to a caribbean island and then his ex oh then there's this whole bomb not bomb plot like a virus plot can anyone explain the virus thing to me well it's the most perfect weapon isn't it it's it it... so it's a virus 
that uh, virus is actually virus. It, it's the ultimate MacGuffin, in my opinion. It can it can cure all diseases, but if you change one little tiny thing of it, it will kill everyone in the world. And it doesn't get more ridiculous than that, really, does it? That could have been in No Time to Die, and I would not have batted an eyelid, actually. I think if you explained it a little more, I, I would have bought it. Oh, yeah. That's a that's a 100% a Bond-type uh, know, MacGuffin, as it were. It also feels like something like a Twilight Zone thing. You just do, you type the wrong thing and it kills It everyone. reminded me of um, the virus in Mission Impossible 2 as well. You know, why does this thing exist? Oh, well, you know, we just made it because we could, because we're scientists. Yes. Because of plot. They didn't mm. stop to consider whether they should. Ah. So, yeah, you've got this, this, like, plot that's running concurrently to his retirement in the Caribbean. And then his ex-girl... No, it's not his ex-girlfriend, is it? His, ex, his ex-girlfriend has died. Yeah, it, can we can we talk about the backstory to his retirement? Yes, and we the, should. The flashbacks to whatever the hell went down with him and his partner, because that that was disturbing. That took a big leap from this is an entertaining glossy spy fantasy to this is some dark stuff. Well, the film is sort of interspliced with flashbacks to a mission that seems to have gone wrong in a forest, and his his ex wife, I think, gets burnt alive. I think it's his fiance. Yeah, and he's because it's very complicated. Okay, he's he's too slow to stop her because he's a bit out of condition. That's how it looked to me that he was running to save her, but he just wasn't fit enough to get there in time. I don't know what it spells out for the rest of us if he's not fit enough. There was also some quite amazing footage where um, his his emotion is telegraphed to us by how his jowls are wobbling about as he watches what's going on with the torturing. Is that when he's screaming directly in the like he's lit in the face by the flame? Yeah, which is yeah. so good. It's available as an official GIF. You can use it in your tweets. I, I frequently do. I've downloaded the trailer. Oh, fantastic! Yes, it's a it's a, it's a great shot, and we will be using it online. Um, but yeah, so this, uh, so he has a dark history, which is why he retires from the from the game, the spy game, and um, yeah, this woman from his team from years ago turns up at their hotel, and she's dating Eric Roberts Blake, something or other, who turns out to be a nefarious person doing nefarious things, and has this virus, and they eventually get convinced to try and take Eric Roberts down, and spoilers. They do, uh, through some uh, really poorly directed action sequences and lots of cutaways. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the gist of the story. But how do you think, I mean, as a story, did it work for you guys? No. The more I think about it, the less it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've, you've got the character of Vivian, who is like his old flame and it gets to the point when when they do embrace and kiss finally and it's like i've always loved you and yet you know you've always loved me and it's like well what about the fiance that died on the mission but we how did why do we have no backstory on this relationship beforehand yeah i mean it it's it's tough to find a, a moment that doesn't have a hole in it in this film so it's more about just like well, this ship is sinking. Can we have fun and play some violins as it well, goes down? Surely we'd be singing Mac the Knife as the ship goes down in this case. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, how um, many times in this film is that song sung? But that woman, she was working so hard. It was like, this is my big chance this is at it. stardom. This yeah, is it. working Michael it, working it, baby. Oh, I've got God. It. Oh. Can, you, can you imagine that call to her like parents or her partner? And like, I've got it. I've got the role of a lifetime. I'm going to be big. I'm working for Michael Flatley. That just, no, I, I I wish her well. Uh, she's yeah. um, I'm sure she's lovely. Uh, I I don't think I'll be doing any spy master interviews for this film, so um, I can say. But well, if I there's want. any justice, then she's got a lucrative future on the convention circuit ahead of her. For sure, for sure. Well, let's um, let's go like some favorite bits, things that we did like. Does anyone have a favorite moment they'd like to point out in the film? I thought the uh, the poker game with Eric Roberts was fantastic, but not for great reasons. I, I actually <laughs> when when they sit down and they're going to play poker, and you kind of get the the, the vibe of Casino Royale with uh, Daniel Craig and Mads Mikkelsen sitting across from each other, and then instantly your hero folds on the first hand, and you're like, "Oh, I wasn't expecting that to happen." 
I, I feel like they should have been playing Snap or Happy Families or something. It's like that meme where Mads <laughs> is playing Hungry Hungry Hippos, Hungry Hippos or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, you do get a classic line in that scene. It's one of the lines I wrote down on my phone when we left the theatre. Where our man Blakely, Blackley, I should say, Michael Flatley, turns to Eric Roberts Blake. That's where I'm getting confused. Actually, that's really annoying. Blackley and Blake as your lead. That's a first rule of naming characters. Come on. Yeah. Can't tell them apart. But he turns to Eric Roberts and says, Who I am is none of your concern. And what I do is out of your control. That is a good line, though. But it's just read badly. That is. Bwah, bwah. Makes no sense, but it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. It just, it just comes out in the middle of a sentence as well. Like It's just like they're passing him the cards. He just says it to him. It's definitely a line that's made for a trailer. Yeah. There's a lot of those. Yeah. There's a lot of those. Yeah, there is. They do salute several times and, like, say, to the end throughout the film, which I thought was a nice thing. I was going to try and make that a thing, but no one's seen the film. So maybe I'll end the show just with you guys because you'll get it at least. Um, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Alice. A moment you liked. Gosh, I'm drawing a blank because I know there was at least one moment where I thought I might be going to choke and die because I was laughing so much, but I can't remember what triggered it. I guess my brain has erased it so I can come to it fresh when I watch it on streaming. And buy it on Blu-ray. Yeah. Of course. Um, well, a massive I'll... watch party round my gallons of booze. Yeah. Every, take a sip every time a hat goes on and off. I think for me, the highlight was, and it is it's actually quite hard. You're right to pick out a scene that like works for you because they don't usually. Um, I quite liked the going back and forth when Eric Roberts and, uh, and Nicole Evans, Vivian, the uh, old partner, the old flame, uh, at dinner, and then Michael Flatley has the gumption to just take her away and dance with her right next to her partner, Eric Roberts, and just, like, rub it in his face? <laughs> it's like, wow. That was so bizarre. I mean, Eric Roberts doesn't even react to that happening. It's utterly just strange to watch. I assume he goes to some swinging parties, perhaps? I, I think he was probably on drugs. Oh, or, or on, I mean, that's Eric Roberts, not the character of Blake. That's <laughs> two, two different things here. Um... Yeah, I, I, I think that's one of the things I laughed at the most in the film, which is the fact that like some guy comes up, and Eric Roberts is just such a, I don't like using the word like beta male. I think it's nonsense, but like he's so overpowered by the masculinity of Michael Flatley that he cannot react and take his woman back. I guess. Yeah, I mean, what has Eric Roberts got other than money and looks? Well, well, we'll never know. Um, I, I, I will come back to you, Alice, if you think of something. Um. But let's go for like. I did think oh, of, there is a, there is a, there is another great moment with Eric Roberts, and it is it is a cliche scene. It's that trope of the villain is going to kill one of his underlings who's failed him. Oh, and be, be, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, being good. on the yacht, and his and his banker has screwed up and not had money transferred in, and he has his bodyguard just pick him up and toss him in the sea without actually killing him. But then the greatest thing of all time happens as one of the crew of the boat runs up to him and says, hey, you can't throw people off the boat. And the bodyguard just breaks his neck and <laughs> swivels his head around. I mean, that, that's just someone who either walked in from a different movie or didn't know he was in a movie and went, hang on. It's, it's the real captain of the boat. And they were just like guerrilla filming on someone else's boat. He's like, hey, you can't throw people off the boat. And then they kill the man. <laughs> Luckily, it's yeah, all of the film. banker. They didn't actually kill. He's he's there paddling in the they water. Need him, all of, all of they need him, John. They need the banker. Apparently. All right. Well, I'll, yeah, right. I'll ask another question then. We'll go for MVP of the film. Let's go for. I'll 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 lead us off so we, you guys have time to think about it. I'm going to go with Eric Roberts. He is. Well, he knows exactly what film he's in. And so we assume he's drunk for most of the filming. <laughs> and I'm all for that. And he is chewing the scenery. If you put him uh, and cut out Ricardo Montalban of Wrath of Khan, he would fit in perfectly up against Bill Shatner in that film. They are acting to the back of the theatre, probably to the, the welcoming doors at the front. Uh, I'm going for Eric Roberts as my MVP. What about you, John? Aside from the drone pilot, um, I'd have to say whoever seriously, the drone pilot, he earns his money. I hope he got paid by the hour on this one. 
But um, I have to give it to um, the costume department because the the costumes do look incredible in this. Yeah, and they do photograph well on the, on the uh, high definition cameras they're using. Yeah, it's it's a gorgeous looking film at times, and yeah, they are all well costumed. I, I I mean, I I was at one point trying to count the amount of outfits that Michael Flatley goes through. I did lose count. Um, I hope when it comes out on digital, I will try and find out. But uh, yeah, he ha- he goes through several costume changes more often than Bond does in like Thunderball, and he goes through tons in that film. Um, what about you, Alice? Nick, gotta be Nick. You had to shout it too. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to look on his IMDb. I'm curious to know what Ian Beatty's done in the past, but he was the only person I like recognised apart from Ian Roberts, Eric Roberts. Sorry. Oh, there was Patrick Bergen in there as well as the head of MI6. Was he the chap in like the phone box? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh yeah, there was a whole much more interesting subplot with people getting chased around and jumping in and out of phone boxes and actually having fun and doing spy things. Because it had like a, a, a I don't want to say Le Carre adjacent, but like it had like a, a dark spy thing going on in London. Mm. Um, and you know, like especially with Le Carre stories, it's always like the spy who's done who's like bored of it all and he hates his job and it's the worst thing in the world. And that boss man really did like hate his job by the feels of it. Um, We've seen so it, many people die. Yeah, and uh, but not Michael Flatley. He is he is the true savior of their spy organization. Now he's seen so many people die, and not Michael Flatley. Yes, we tried, we tried. God damn it. Um, let's go for then. Is there a moment that really grated you? Like it really got under your skin as like the worst moment of the film. I'm going to go with the end shootout. Uh, so for pre- for reference, the film basically wraps up in a shootout between Eric Roberts, his henchman, Michael Flatley, and Ian Beatty's Nick. Uh, and basically, instead of having the shootout, it basically just cuts away. And then it comes back to everyone <laughs> being shot. It feels like something out of The Simpsons. It's ridiculous. I... I mean, we all know what happens, but you've got the drone cameraman getting the above shot. He's getting his last paycheck of the mm-hmm. film for that first few seconds. But you've you've missed that one crucial detail of that shootout. Go on, and that is that is just before Michael Flatley draws his guns and fires. He says, "Let's dance." Yes, yes. He has he is the one liner machine, isn't he? And that's the one bone that gets thrown to fans of his uh, dance career. And I think everyone was maybe expecting a little more than that. I mean, it probably would have been too far if he started doing the jig to avoid bullets. That's too much of a tip and, and a nod to it. I don't know. In fact, that feels like a hot shots kind of thing. But, you know, if you've been hired as a secret agent for your incredible dancing skills, which presumably he was. Hmm. Well, let's go with Alice this time. What was the scene that griped you? Okay, so not one particular scene, but from a feminist point of view, this is a terrible, terrible movie. Um, we have his fiance. She doesn't speak. I don't think we know her name. We just get told in about 30 seconds that, ooh, there's this couple and they're in love. And oh, now she's dead and he's at the funeral. And dead woman being the catalyst for the hero's actions is very tired, very cliche, very pretty misogynist. Um fails the Bechdel test. There are a bunch of women. I don't think two women ever have a conversation that is not about Michael Flatley. But the absolute worst thing for me is um, Vivian being completely unaware that she's engaged to a criminal and a sadist. And you know, all of us know it as soon as he appears. Uh, there are plenty of hints and signals. We see her see him treat her really badly. And do the whole, oh, go and buy yourself something pretty. Clearly, I, I have bought you. She was, ev- she was even sent by MI6 to investigate him. How does she not know that he's a villain? It's... She uh, admits it to Flatley later on, that it, she, he was a mission and he fell in lo- uh, that they fell in love. It's never the man, is it? It is never the man who no. accidentally falls in love with an enemy agent and has to be rescued. It's always the woman, because, you know, we're just stupid. We follow our hearts. No, it's a very valid criticism. I mean, we're kind of joking around with this film, but there's a lot of things that are quite bad about it. Uh, that being one of them, there's also some problematic um, 
elements that I might leave for another day. But yeah, I remember you even turning to me, Alice, in the in the theatre and whispering, I, I don't think this passes the Bechdel test. And I was like, no, I don't think it does. And that was about halfway through and it didn't. It still had didn't, 45 minutes to go. No, it did not. So I think my absolute nadir would be when she messes up nicking the thing from his suitcase. I mean, she's only a fully trained agent. She only, what, forgets to lock it again after she's nicked the thing? Something that a child of six stealing cookies from the biscuit tin would manage to cover up his tracks better than. You you know to leave it as you found it and they'll never catch you. That's how it works, right? That's how the law works. No, that was a particularly badly written moment. Um, Well, let's spin off on this for a second because this film was not only starring Michael Flatley, but it was directed by Michael Flatley, written by Michael Flatley, and produced by Michael Flatley. It's quite the, uh, I don't know, perfect auteur masterpiece in that sense. He is his vision brought to life. What was he going for with this script? Was it just an homage to things that had come before? Or was it like a vanity, I want to be the star? I think it was definitely I want to be the star, but he he wanted to put it on terms of um, things that he loved. Obviously, I mean the 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 character of the Blackbird is one part um, James Bond, one part Frank Sinatra, two parts um, Humphrey Bogart from Casablanca, and th- there is no way you can even deny any of that. That's all there is to that character whatsoever. It's like I, I remember reading an interview with Wayne Newton years ago. And he said he really wanted to be in a Bond film. And eventually like, he was he was annoying uh, Cuppy Broccoli for years to get in. And eventually they're like, okay, we'll, we'll write you into License to Kill. And so he does his little thing in License to Kill. And that was the end of it. Can you imagine if Wayne Newton had turned around instead and funded a film with him as the master spy? I would watch the hell out of that. As would I. Oh, we would all watch it. I, I have no, everyone listening to this would probably watch that film. It's called. Uh, is it called Bless Your Heart? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, but this is this is akin to that. It's like I I want to be Bond, and you won't let me be Bond, so I'm going to be Bond. Yeah, you'd think he could just hire some people and do it in the privacy of his bedroom. Well, I. I that's a whole other thing that he gets up to. I don't want to know anything else about that, Alice. That, that's some role play kink for him. But um... so it's basically what you're saying is him making this film is like the millionaire's equivalent of when you go to have your photograph taken and you're dressed up as a cowboy and they give you the sepia photos. Yeah, that's what that is. It's, yeah. it's a million dollar version of that. And we all like that. We would all like to live this dream. I would certainly like to script myself a spy film. Well, I... let's spin it off. What are we doing? You get to write your own spy film. Let's have a quick... Uh, let's go with Alice first. Go if you were going to write yourself a spy film, what are you going for? Oh, gosh. Well, I would put in all the things that I love. So there would be lots of aviation scenes. Mm-hmm. Uh, there'd probably be a, a dog sled, maybe like a husky chase mm-hmm. across Siberia. Uh, oh, Are you the lead of your own script? I might be the plucky sidekick. I might be Nick. Ah, you're Nick. Okay, I, li- I, I, I like that. That's fine. Um, no, I'd watch that. Like it, it seems very like Snowbound, like One of Majesty, something like that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, because then I could also enjoy the sort of sixties ski lodge vibe, mm-hmm. which uh, I dig very much. Everyone wearing cool colours and things like that. That'd yeah, lots of wood panelling, big central fire pit. Yeah, like a, a sofa that raises from the floor. And goes back down again. Yeah, sort of uh, north by northwest as well. A bit of that yeah. in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I would watch that film. That sounds better already. Uh, John, what would you write yourself? Is it a 60s film or are, you, or are you making it more contemporary? Oh, I think I'd do it contemporary but homaging, so to speak, the 60s. Okay. Kind of... uh, def- definitely, definitely a ski chase in there. Definitely a casino scene. Mm. Um, tropical island the villain lives on. Has to be. Yeah, absolutely. Because you get the offset thing, you have the skiing scenes earlier in the film, and then you have the finale on the tropical island. Mm-hmm. Well, will you be in your trunks? Will you emerge from the sea? Oh, it'd have to be a wetsuit, I think. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not as uh, insanely vain as Michael Flatley is. I'd have to, uh, yeah, be be at least reasonable with it. 
Well, that was going to... I, I was doing that as an experiment to see what you both did because I noted that Alice made herself the sidekick in her own story. How beautiful is that? John, You, I think you were the, the hero of the story, but it wasn't all yeah, about you. Yeah, I would you. lay myself a hero. I, you, you, didn't, you didn't say that you were going to like beat everyone up and stuff. This Michael Flatley film, he is the catalyst behind everything that happens in this film. He takes down all the bad guys... He he is like he uncovers all the nonsense and he he takes the bad guy down. Oh, I I would also beat everyone up. I, I thought that just went without saying. Oh, okay. You, oh, well, fine. But you're the plucky sidekick. You you get to like the the lead person gets to struggle with them and then you come over and smack them over the head. Yeah. Yeah. Show them up. I like it. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Calling all agents. Independent podcasting, much like the spy game requires considerable resources, whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a top secret volcano lair, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right, as you may know, we've activated the Spy Hearts Patreon, home of our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors and full film commentaries with more intel than a Basil Exposition briefing. Cam. What have we got in our crosshairs this month? Well, Scott, we're continuing with the Dirty Airy franchise with 1973's Magnum Force. So do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do ya? And if that sounds delicious, then become a true spy hard today and join the circus at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before this message self-destructs, Cam, resume the spy jinx. Um, would you make this film if you had the money? If I had the money, yeah. And as I said, like what Blackbird should be is it's a film that you make to go, look, that's me on the screen as a super spy. And I just relish in enjoying it. It's like a keepsake for your, for your own kind of self-worth and vanity. Mm. I mean, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that's why Mike Myers made Austin Powers, because he wanted to be a spy in a film that was an homage to all the spy films of the 60s that he loved and that worked for him i i could buy it i mean I, fair play to him if that's the sort of uh inspiration behind austin powers but uh gave us some good films now i i was gonna wrap up begin to wrap up with a question first before i ask the bigger question is this the worst spy film you've ever seen no i don't think so yeah i'm gonna say no for me i've seen it wasn't boring like, I don't think this film was boring. What would you say to that? No, it kept up the action. I don't think it was boring, but it felt long. I really felt like, like there's halfway through, I think, when they're starting to build the romance between um, Blackley and uh, Vivian. That just seemed to drag out. And when, when it was over and I walked out of the cinema and I looked at my watch, I couldn't believe what time it was and the film was only about an hour and 25 minutes long because <laughs> it really did feel like it was going over two hours. Wow, no, I felt it was a good length. Like, yeah, this is 90 minutes on the nose. That, that's what we like. And it wasn't like tons of trailers beforehand in our showing as well. They literally hit play at 9 o'clock and we were out at 10.30. It was a blessing. Yeah, more experiences like this. Yeah, please. But, Alice, is it the worst spy film you've ever seen? No, I, mean, I know this is easy targets, but I would certainly rewatch Blackbird over Casino Royale or Operation Kid Brother. Okay, Connery. Oh, man. Taking oh, hits yeah. today. I still haven't seen that one yet. Uh, saving it for a special day. But um, No, I mean, there's ones that we've tackled on the show that I wouldn't want to watch again compared to this. This this was fun. Although I, I, will, I do say that maybe watching it by yourself might bring that enjoyment down a bit. Yeah, it's definitely a... Certainly on the first viewing. Yeah, like this is the perfect, you know, know, like the midnight screenings, Rocky Horror Picture Show, that sort of thing. You play this, you get a crowd together, you're going to have a good time. But what was wonderful was that, you know, Rocky Horror and Sound of Music, the Prince Charles have been doing these audience participation shows for years. Everyone's really familiar with the source material. They know what to do. They know what's going on. This one was creating itself as it went along. We were making it. We were coming up with the callbacks and the responses and the bits where you cheer or take a drink. It, it was um, yeah, a cult in the making. Yeah, I mean, 
Well, you know, that's actually a very good point. Is this a future cult film? I hope so. I would happily go and see this once a year in a screening with a big audience to have fun with it. I think it would probably be an audience of Spy Hard's listeners. Oh, I, I would sort that screening out. Don't worry, I'll book it. We'll, we'll, we'll just go. It's fine. Well, I, I have to think that... Because here's that problem, right? We all went to packed out screenings, but I think everyone was doing it for the joke. It wasn't to appreciate the film craft of Michael Flatley. And, I mean, have you ever seen that the documentary about the guy who made Trolls 2? No, I haven't. So, the chap who made Trolls 2, the director, forgive me, I can't remember his name, didn't know that his film was being used as like a midnight movie that people took the mickey out of. And he went to a packed out screening one night and saw everyone laughing at his film. And it broke his heart. And they captured it on the documentary. It's actually quite a horrible thing to watch this man break down as he finds out the film he poured his life into is just being, you know, laughed out of the room. Now, I don't... And this is what worries me about it maybe not coming to streaming because these showings have done well. You look at the returns, they've done sold out basically both of the ones we went to and there were several more at the Prince Charles that sold out. I wonder sometimes if Michael Flatley will release it because it's more being like joked about online than being spoken about in, in a positive way. I think if you have the ego to make this film in the first place, you can let plebs like us laughing at it wash right over you. Yeah, absolutely. I think just even watching some of his acting choices in the film, I'm not convinced that Michael Flatley is actually human anymore. <laughs> And he's not really in touch with uh, with us and our sense of humour over his uh, his passion project. No, I mean, and to be fair, like, and Alice pointed this out earlier as well. There was talk about this being something to do with tax write offs. This film, a little bit of history for it, was 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 announced in 2018, and they showed a trailer at a film festival, and it was laughed out of the room. And then it was not heard of again for years. And then people were speculating online that it had been a tax write-off, that sort of thing. And then, you know, a few months ago, the trailer turned up online. And they're like, oh, yep, there's going to be screenings in London and Ireland. I, I mean, it's bizarre. I, I'd like... I have a theory about that. Go on. Well, I can't prove anything. It's purely speculation. But I can't help but notice that after this film has been pretty much shelved for four years, it all of a sudden appears after a fairly successful uh, Apple TV series with the same name starring Taron Egerton has been released and marketed around the same time that trailer dropped. Well, that's cheeky. Mm. Yeah, I think there was literally, they found a way to piggyback on the name to get some more interest around it. It's only a theory, but I just think um, it's a bit too much of a coincidence. See, I was looking at taxes and there's like some capital gain stuff that is written off over three years and if you do three years from 2018 it gets you to 2021 so then they could have just put it out in 2022 because then they're just making money on it that was my theory but i i, I don't know if we'll ever find out i don't think there'll be a, a a documentary made about this film i don't know if there'll be a, a proper release other than perhaps a straight to like buy it on streaming and own it digitally um, I'd like to ask questions about it. I'd love to speak on Mike, Michael Flatley about this film and find out a bit more. I'd love to, you know, figure out what was going through his head and not in a bad way because we're taking making jokes about this film and it's it's not a good film. You will laugh at it. It's not great. But at the end of the day, this guy wanted to make a film and he made a complete film. For all its warts, he did it. And that's I mean that as I said I tipped my hat at the start. It's um fair play to the guy. I I don't think I could do it. I don't think I have the resources. But even with the resources to put a film together, that takes a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think he I think he could have taken a little bit more expertise, hiring maybe a writer, hiring maybe a director. Yeah, that that would have been helpful. I think I. It, I mean, there's a world, there's another parallel universe where someone had worked on his script and shot it for him and been the director. And maybe it came out a bit better because it had a different hand to it and had someone to say, actually, we don't need the multiple scenes of you topless, Michael. Um, you don't need to be making out with that 20-year-old. 
Let's pull back from that. Uh, yeah. Would have been a nice touch. But I'll, I'll throw out the final question to you both before we start looking at wrapping up. Should you see this film if you can? John? I think if you can see this film with an audience, do it. Because it's a fantastic experience. If you go and see this film in, in the cinema and there's like one or two people there, you'll probably find it irritating. You'll see the cracks in it. It's not going to make you laugh. But there is just with a, with a big audience enjoying it as, in a way it wasn't originally designed and looking at it as a comedy, it, it, it just sets you off and you will be laughing all the way through it. And you will have a good time with it, which, you know, is better than it just rotting in, like, you know, a streaming platform that doesn't advertise it or sat in Michael Flatley's vault not being watched by anyone. I, I really want to see the person, like, in, in, in a year's time or, or 10 years' time, and they're flipping through Amazon Prime, Netflix, whatever, and they go, Blackbird, Michael Flatley? Oh, okay. 90 minutes later, they sit there and go, what the f*** was that? Like, with no context to it. Like, we know where this film came from, and we heard the funny reviews, so we were able to go in with, like, a, a mindset of we know what we're getting. But someone going into this completely blind, I, they must... They, they, they'll have a trip. Well, I mean, it, it has a cracking poster. If I had seen the poster, and I didn't know who Michael Flatley was, and I wasn't on the internet, I would have gone, wow, I must see this. It looks like exactly my kind of movie, and I would have gone in hotly anticipating it. It's got that sort of like, um, like Taken esque dad on a mission vibe to it. Mm. Older man, in that sense, doing an action film. Very Liam Neeson. He seemed to have pioneered that role. Yeah, it looked very much like the Mission Impossible Fallout poster as well. Like the color scheme's practically identical. I'll have to have a look at that. Not the one I'm looking at, but I love that. Um, after the Queen died, the Prince Charles tweeted a photo of its exterior and the marquee was thanking her majesty for 70 years and it was a really nice simple touching tribute and the blackbird poster is right there it's part of history now <laughs> and we had a photo alice and i in front of the poster which i put up online this week so you can all gaze at uh, how ugly i am um and how i'm put to shame by alice but um yeah i i'm glad i got to see it in that group setting, I don't know if I would recommend someone watches it by themselves unless you are a spy Uber fan, which why would you be listening if you're not? And perhaps a bit of a masochist. Ever so slightly. I disagree there. I, I think that everyone should see this film because uh, we all have things that we want to do and maybe a bit scared to because what if we're not any good? Like, oh, I want to write a novel. I want to make a film. I want to get up and sing or dance or do stand-up, but I'm afraid I'm not very good. Watch Blackbird. Watch the absolute confidence with which Michael Flatley writes, produces, directs and stars in a spy film. And you will know that anyone can do anything. If Michael Flatley can be James Bond, you can do absolutely anything. That, that is a beautiful way to wrap up this episode. What, what a lovely sentiment. Well, there you go, folks. That was Blackbird. It's hard to talk about a film that hasn't got much of a plot, hasn't got much in the way of acting, and hasn't got much in the way of anything apart from a few laughs if you're drunk. Um, it's, got, it's got a lot I, of Michael Flatley. It's got a lot of Michael Flatley's hats. I, I, I wonder what his wardrobe is like at home. Does he have a whole hat section? I'd like to see it. Um, but I want to thank John and Alice for coming on board. John, you first. I mentioned it at the front, but you know, if people want to hear more from you, where can they find you online? Uh, you can find me online on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Not Perfected Yet. And you can also read my blog, Not Perfected Yet, a James Bond blog at notperfectedyet.wordpress.com. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes below. And John, before I wrap up on you, sir, everyone on this show gets asked the same question. What's your favorite spy movie? Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. Good answer. Good answer. I like it. Alice, over to you. Where can people find you online? Oh, mostly on Twitter, at Husky Tear. It is Bond stuff, terrible puns, stuff about aeroplanes, um, enormous quantities of lust for Timothy Dalton, if, if you like that sort of thing. Come along. 
I, I do, and that's why I follow you. I am, uh, <laughs> I'm constantly lusting after that man. Uh, we actually uh, recorded an episode on The Rocketeer the other day, so I spent a good time talking about Timothy Dalton, and I interviewed someone who made the film, uh, and they were also fawning over Timothy Dalton, so that was a nice time. Uh, he sounds like a nice bloke. But yes, I will put links to everyone in the show notes below. Alice, though, what's your favourite spy movie? It is Austin Powers' International Man of Mystery. Wow. I like it. Is it because it's like it's kind of like the sixties vibe? It's calling back to that with modern sensibilities. Yes, yeah. Um, it feels like it was designed purely for the pleasure of people like me who are really nerdy about sixties spy films and series. So you're a massive fan of the Doctor Goldfoot series, I assume. Well, I am actually. Yes. Oh, I I watched one once. That's definitely a thing that happened. That that is about all you'll ever get out of a Goldfoot fan, to be fair. Um. Alice, John, I want to thank you both for stopping by on our declassified episode looking at 2022-2018's Blackbird. And before you all head off, do stick around next week. We are celebrating 60 years of James Bond with our Casino Royale 2006 review. We also have two Spy Master interviews with two actors from the film and a bonus Casino Royale. 1954 review yes we're going to watch the tv show too for our sins do not forget to join us uh your mission should you choose to accept it is to watch casino royale 2006 join us next week and do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week bless me father for i have sinned and i'm about to sin again (laughs) 